will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between an employee of an airline company and a customer. You have thirty seconds to look at questions one to six. GB Airlines.、Uh, this is Kyle speaking. How can I help? Hi, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm calling on behalf of Mr. John Sparrow to claim expenses for a delay in his flight last week. Good morning, Mr. Walsh.、Uh, thank you for calling. Could you please tell me the flight number and the date of departure? The date of departure was the 24th of January, 2016. I'm afraid I don't have the flight number in front of me at the moment. Okay, that's all right. One moment. Uh, could you tell me where was Mr. Sparrow departing from? He was departing from Athens.、Uh, is that Athens, Greece, or Athens, Georgia? Athens, Greece. Right. And what was the destination? It was Heathrow, London. Right. We've got two flights from Athens to London Heathrow on the twenty fourth of January, twenty sixteen. Was it the three twenty five p.m. flight or the nine forty five p.m.? It was the later one, nine forty five. Okay, so the flight number is GB one o one one. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes, I can see that Mr. Sparrow's flight was cancelled, and he was booked on the next flight on the twenty fifth of January at three twenty five p.m. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. According to our system, one of my colleagues spoke with Mr. Sparrow on the phone on the twenty fourth to inform him of the cancellation and offered to book a hotel for him for the night. But Mr. Sparrow preferred to book one himself. Yes, because he didn't want to stay near the airport, as the next flight was in the afternoon. Yes, of course.、Uh, could you tell me which hotel he stayed at? Yes, he stayed at the Hypnos Hotel. Oh,、uh, could you spell that for me? Of course, that's H Y P N O S. Right.、Uh, thank you for that. And could you please tell me how much the total cost was for the night? Sure. It was seventy-three euros. Right.、Uh, do you have a copy of the receipt for that? Yes, of course. Would you like me to send it to you?、Uh, yes, please. Can I email a picture of it to you? Absolutely.、Uh, the email address is refunds at gbairlines.co.uk. Great. Thank you. No problem.、Uh, were there any other expenses you wish to claim? Actually, yes. There was also the taxi ride to the airport and the taxi ride back the next day. Right. And what was the total cost? Um, the first taxi ride was fifty-three euros, and the second one was forty-two. So, sixty-three, seventy-three, eighty-three. Yeah. So the total was ninety-five euros. I'll send you the receipt for those as well. Thank you.、Uh, are there any other expenses? No. I think that's it. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seven to ten. Excellent. So, if you could please send us the receipts for the hotel and the taxi rides, and after we receive them, it should take about forty-eight hours for the funds to reach Mr. Sparrow's account. Perfect. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, yes. There's one more thing.、Um, Mr. Sparrow complained about the meal during the flight. He said that it was a bit bland. Right. 
So he asked me if it was possible to switch to a different meal option for his upcoming flight to Kiev next week. Right, of course. Uh, just give me a minute, please. Right, I see that Mr. Sparrow had the light meal option for his flight to London, and you would like to change that. Uh, what would you like to change it to? What are the other options? We've got 12 different meal options. Uh, would you like me to list all of them for you? Well, Mr. Sparrow has told me that he would prefer something without meat. How many of these do not contain meat? We've got three meal options without meat. Uh, we've got the vegetarian option, the vegan option, and the Asian vegetarian. What's the difference? There's a variety of different dishes served with each option. Uh, for example, next week the vegetarian option will be a small spinach and feta cheese pie, a bread roll, a salad, and tropical fruit. And the vegan option? The vegan option doesn't include any dairy products, and it also doesn't include fowl, eggs, or honey. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the specific menu for this week, but I can email it to you as soon as it becomes available. Oh, could you do that? That would be great. Yes, of course. Uh, I can email you a detailed description of all the meal options if you like. Yes, please. No problem. Uh, please do not forget to call us back to change the meal option. Uh, you need to do that 48 hours before the departure time for international flights and 24 hours for domestic flights. So 48 hours for this one then? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, transatlantic flights require 48 hours. All flights within Europe require 24 hours, so in this case, you will need to call us 24 hours in advance. Um, I apologize for that. Okay, great. So, could I please have your email address so I can send you the menus? Certainly. It's matt.walsh at sparrowlimited.com. Now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear part of a local radio program about fighting air pollution in Canadian towns. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, folks, and welcome to the Information Roundup on your own local radio station. This is Larry Knowles talking to you this morning on Tuesday, the 25th of May. And the first item coming up is a reminder to you all out there about Canadian Clean Air Day, which is on June 6th. In case you weren't around for the last one, this is a chance for Canadians everywhere to focus on the problems of air pollution and to actually try to do something to help reduce the problem. How many Canadians do you think die annually because of air pollution? 2,000? 3,000? Well, the rate is a staggering 5,000 and it's likely to grow unless we do something. And it's this concern with your health that's the driving force behind the government campaign that is sponsoring Clean Air Day. So what causes air pollution in the first place? Well, the transportation sector accounts for 27% of all greenhouse gases produced in Canada. It's also the biggest source of that thick, polluted air from traffic fumes that we call smog. And it's the tiny particles and ground-level ozone in smog that are the main causes of health problems and even deaths across the country. Of course, it's worse in the big cities, but researchers have only recently realized that all you need are low levels of air pollution to seriously damage your health, so we're all at risk. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, what can we do to fight air pollution? Well, it should be pretty obvious by now that the way we get to and from work every day can have a big impact on the air we breathe. So the easiest action you can take on Clean Air Day is to accept what we call the commuter challenge and get to work on foot or by cycling for a change. If you have to use your car, try carpooling and share the drive, or better still, use public transit. If everyone tries this for just one day, you'll be amazed by the difference it can make to the air in our towns and cities. But there's more you can do to improve air quality. For example, you can plant trees. And if you don't have a garden, then you can do your bit in other ways. For instance, did you know that modern, improved wood stoves can reduce wood smoke by as much as 80 to 90%? So you can make a big difference if you upgrade the appliances you use in your home. The government is also working hard on your behalf to clean up our air. Its priority is to reduce the emissions that cause smog, and they have clear plans to get there. Last year, Canada and the United States agreed to reduce emissions on both sides of the border between the two countries, and they plan to reach their targets in the next few years. The government's also taking action to get cleaner fuels. It's already reduced the sulfur contained in gasoline, and it hopes to reach the reduction target for sulfur and diesel by next year. But the measures don't just focus on the motorist. The federal government's also working to reduce emissions from power plants and factories right across the provinces. You can find out all about government action and all the plans for Clean Air Day events... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear a conversation between three students who are preparing a presentation. You have 30 seconds to look at question 21. Hey guys! Oh hey Gail, you made it! Yes, yeah, sorry. I was stuck at the library paying late fees. Have you guys started going through the data yet? Yeah, we've already collated it and we've started designing the graphs we're going to use in the presentation. Oh really? That's fast. Well, anyway, here's what we've got so far. Okay, so... Wow, 38% said they thought about quitting school in the first year. That's a huge number. Yeah, and only 10% said they were happy at school from beginning to end. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I thought the majority would be happy here. Well, just remember that about 30% of the school population are foreign students. And from the UK students, only 2% are actually from the area. So, I guess it makes sense that people would miss home. Yeah, but to want to actually quit school... Well, they didn't want to exactly, they just thought about it. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 22 to 25. OK, so how should we organise the presentation? What did you guys decide? Well, 
Kevin and I were saying that we should start by explaining what the topic of our research was and how we decided to collect the data. So, I'll start by saying that our topic was how first-year students felt a month after beginning school and how their attitudes progressed and changed by the end of the academic year. So then we were thinking that I should explain that the population we want to study was obviously first-year students, but because we need their complete experience from the beginning to the end of their first year, we'd have to actually poll students in their second and third year. And then we said that you should explain how we access the population. So I'll say that we got the permission from the school to go to different classes from different departments and hand out the surveys in paper form, right? Right. And that it took us about three weeks to complete this part of our research. So then we need to describe the three different areas of focus of our survey. So Lindsay can do that. Uh, say that the survey had three sections. The first one asking just some general questions about the age, gender, nationality and field of study of each student. Then the second one focused on how they felt in their first six months at school. And the third, how they felt in the summer after their first year was complete. That sounds good. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 26 to 30. OK, so let me see the breakdown. Uh, OK, so we've got an equal distribution of boys and girls. That's good. Almost equal. 51% of the participants were boys. The rest were girls. Right, and 70% of the participants were British, while the other 30% were... 10% were from America and Asia, 2% were from Africa, and 18% were European. We had a small number of Australians as well, 0.03%, so I guess Europeans were 17.97% if you want to be precise. Which we should. Anyway, and obviously the age was all 20 or 21, with a few 19-year-olds. Only about 5%. No, wait, 4%, right? No, it's 5%, look. Right, OK. So Lindsay will describe the three sections, and then you, Kevin, you'll describe the demographic and geographical breakdown, and I... Uh, you can start with the graph, and then we'll all explain the data together. Right. So we'll put this graph up on the board and explain that most students experience some form of homesickness or mild depression in the beginning of their course. But we need to point out that by the end of the year, it was only 5% that still felt like quitting school. Yeah, but remember that we didn't actually have the opportunity to interview or poll any of the students who left school, so the information we have only relates to current students, and those numbers might be bigger in reality. Yeah, I guess we need to mention that. But we did check the dropout rate for the last two years, and it was very low, so at the end of the day, the numbers can't be much bigger. Yeah. Anyway, so after we explain the data and we show the three graphs with the background information and the responses for six months and one year, we should spend some time also talking about... Now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking to a group of science students. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the science faculty. As you may know, my field of study is neurobiology, so you may be wondering what I have to say to those of you who are studying physics or chemistry or geology, even those of you who intend to become doctors. In fact, what I have to say is aimed especially at those who wish to enter the medical profession, though the main point applies to all of you. And what is my main point? Basically, it is that you shouldn't get stuck in too narrow a specialization. What I mean is, too often doctors and scientists become experts on one small aspect of their subject and neglect the rest. Perhaps you have heard the joke about a doctor being introduced to another doctor as an expert on the nose. Oh yes, said the other doctor. Which nostril? I know that more and more it is necessary to specialize, because when you finish your studies, you have to find a place in the job market. But I do believe that it is damaging both to you personally and to the profession. You may be surprised to know how many physicians in the past were men of wide culture. Many were interested in the humanities, from the arts to literature to philosophy. A surprising number of them, from Rabelais to William Carlos Williams, became poets, novelists, and playwrights. Men of science have written clearly and intelligently about society, psychology, and politics. This tradition is not dead. Today, such eminent scientists as Stephen Jay Gould, Jared Diamond, and Richard Dawkins are well known as popularizers of science while maintaining high standards. But more of them in a minute. I'm not saying that while you are studying anatomy, you should sign up for a course in English literature, but reading a few works of fiction in your own time will show you the human mind, just as your anatomy classes show you the human body. Science faculties and medical schools, it seems to me, now largely ignore this human dimension. Furthermore, the study of medicine, and psychology for that matter, is largely about what has gone wrong with the body and the mind. That is, it mostly deals with the abnormal. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 40. So, to try and correct this situation, if only in a small way, I have come up with some extra reading for you to do. Don't worry, I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't think they were enjoyable as well as interesting. The first on my list I'm sure you've all heard of, even if you haven't read it, it's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Now, don't turn your noses up at it just because it's now officially a school book and is written to entertain as well as inform. In fact, I've found it a very good bedside book. Next come a couple of the writers I mentioned earlier. Any collection of essays by Stephen Jay Gould is worth reading. He writes clearly in a language non-scientists can easily understand. In fact, a lot of his essays are responses to questions about science from the general public. He's also entertaining on the subject of baseball. Perhaps you should start with Gould's Wonderful Life. 
he writes brilliantly about natural history and shows how much imagination and excitement there is in scientific discovery. Then there's Jared Diamond's The Rise and Fall of the Third Chimpanzee, which shows us how close we are to the apes and forces us to look at some of the darker aspects of human nature. After reading it, you won't forget your animal ancestry. But don't let that put you off. It's very readable. You're probably saying to yourselves, "Just a minute. These are all science books. What about the fiction?" I'll come to those in a later lecture. At the moment, I'm just trying to get you to read away from your chosen field of study. However, I will recommend one work of fiction now, though it might come as a bit of a surprise. If it does, it means you haven't read it. The book is *The Water Babies* by Charles Kingsley. I can see I have surprised you. Well, it is in fact the first fictional response to Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*. Yes, it is a children's book, but full of surreal fantasy and wit. The fourth. No, the fifth book on the list is a biography, *The Emperor of Scent* by Chandler Burr. To my mind, it's not particularly well written, but it is a fascinating story. It is about Luca Turin, a biophysicist who becomes an expert on perfume, and about how he missed getting the Nobel Prize. If any of you are thinking of a career in scientific research, this book might make you think again. It's a very tough dog-eat-dog business, which brings us to the book that inspired Kingsley's *Water Babies*, that classic of the genre, Charles Darwin's *On the Origin of Species*. If you haven't read it already, perhaps you shouldn't be here. If you have, it won't hurt to read it again. Or if you prefer, read his *The Voyage of the Beagle*, which, as well as being of interest to any natural historian or anyone interested in scientific method, also makes a great travel book. Well, I think that's enough to be going on with, and I can see that it's time to finish up. So please bear in mind throughout whatever course you are studying. Not to neglect other aspects of your wider non-academic education. Thank you. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. It's not a game. It's a red skin.